um, Habitat for Humanity here, Larry Brown and Mark Facknitz, who are gonna share with us how things have been going pre-pandemic and post-pandemic um, and all of the good work that Habitat is doing in the community. So without further ado, I'm gonna give it over to Larry and to Mark. Thank you very much, Mary. Uh, okay, can you hear me now? Yes. Okay. <laughs> uh, appreciate the opportunity to gather again virtually rather than in person, unfortunately, but uh, uh, give you a little background. I think many of you know um, I've been involved with Habitat uh, since uh, retirement, especially, and here in the Valley. Uh, as Mary said, I'm a member of our current 12 person board, as is Mark. Uh, Facnets, uh, and that's a small uh, number, relatively speaking, um, because we have many other committees and volunteers and folks who participate. Uh, what I thought I'd do this morning, because a number of you are uh, aware of Habitat, is I wouldn't spend too much time uh, on the background, but more uh, late in a short while, perhaps have some questions and answers and discussion uh, about habitat. As you mentioned, the uh, COVID in particular has uh, brought some dramatic changes to habitat, uh, as well as, of course, our community at large. But I've, I found it interesting not being originally from the valley, but rather what some people would call a come here. Uh, that uh, I went back to the sort of the beginnings of habitat locally, not nationally or, or internationally. And I found, uh, and as part of our materials given to new board members, a write-up that had been done about the, about the early days of the founding. And it began back in uh, 1987. Uh, there was a Bridgewater inner church food pantry that uh, was, was active at that time. And as the people who participated in this inner church food pantry uh, became more aware of and, and familiar with their clients, uh, they learned of their uh, impoverished backgrounds, uh, their difficult home and living conditions, and uh, as many of you have through our various missions with uh, like the uh, clothes closet and the keister and so forth. So a group of these folks that were in this interfaith um, uh, church food pantry uh, first gathered in the fall of 1987 to talk about how they might uh, be more uh, more than just a food pantry and be of help to the people in this socioeconomic group and to people in general. And uh, some of the early founders here in the Valley were familiar with the work of, uh, <clears throat> of Millard Filmer, uh, who had started uh, with a group called Conania Farms down in uh, America's Georgia, and that eventually grew into habitat as we know it today. Well, these 10 people uh, in this first group uh, were really go-getters, and uh, they uh, had a few organizational meetings, uh, got somebody from Habitat International to come and talk with them. And in the uh, summer, a few months later, in the summer of 1988, they held what they called was the walk. Uh, to help publicize uh, the efforts on substantial housing in the area. And they, uh, this took place over five days. And between June 20th and 25th in 1988, uh, a group of people uh, walked over 90 miles uh, between Bridgewater through Churchville, Stanton, Waynesboro, Grottoes, and Elkton staying overnight in churches with uh, others who offered food and, and accommodations. So that was a, quite a, uh, an undertaking 
to get that uh, publicity and that effort. And it was a kind of a bonding uh, event for those that were involved as well. So by the uh, next uh, November, just uh, basically a year after they'd first met, they were able to purchase uh, a lot in Grottoes and begin the construction of the first home. Uh, and uh, that first home then was dedicated in, uh, in April of 89. And so that was the, the beginnings. And it truly was a grassroots effort uh, here locally, merged with the organizational outreach from the international. And uh, over time, uh, I won't go any further in the history, but over time it became obvious that uh, that was too large of a geographical area to um, give the kind of response that they'd like. And so other uh, habitat chapters were formed down in Augusta County. And the chapter that we call Central Valley Habitat, uh, which has got its office in Bridgewater, uh, reduced its, its so-called territory uh, to Rockingham County which is still a, a huge area, but it's a little more centrally focused than just on Rockingham County. And that's grown into the organization that we have today uh, and which you, many of you have been familiar with. I know Virginia in particular uh, is, the, she and, and Richard were the sponsors of a home uh, built in Elkton and it was uh, referred to as the house that music built. And uh, it was a really substantial financial effort on, as well as a uh, support effort by Virginia, uh, Richard, and all of the other people over at, in Elkton, a couple of the churches uh, that were really behind that. Through its uh, approximately 30 year history now, uh, habitat here uh, in the Central Valley has uh, completed the construction of over 65 homes. And uh, the stories that are uh, available, and I'd gladly share with anybody, uh, are really uh, quite inspiring about the changes that have occurred, uh, about the upward mobility that in for several of the families and children. Uh, began with their home, uh, being able to qualify for a home and, and uh, be involved in it. Uh, that's one of the things that I, I know um, I find particularly uh, rewarding about the habitat uh, approach to things is it, it, you know, we've all heard the sort of the cliche, a uh, hand out or a hand up, and it's certainly a hand up because the families do have to uh, participate in not only financial but in physical ways. Um, we have a, a, an element in the process that's called sweat equity and a potential or future homeowner who's been chosen by the family selection committee uh, has to uh, put in 200 hours of sweat equity if they're a single parent or 400 hours if it's a uh, married family with two parents in the home. Uh, we have provisions for the children to participate. They get some credits for their studies and grades and things like that. So it's, uh, it's an effort that really gets involved uh, with most of the aspects of the home life. Um, the committee, the, the process of habitat starts with, of course, the, the family making a, uh, an application to be considered as a candidate. Uh, that requires them to be very open and sharing of their uh, personal situation, their finance, and their background. Uh, the family, and we have, like I said uh, earlier, several committees within habitat one of our committees is exactly that, uh, family selection. And they'll uh, do, do a very detailed uh, uh, investigation into the family. 
uh, because one of the things we're most concerned about is that it be a successful outcome. And the last thing we want to do is put a family into a home and then find out uh, that they're not able to keep up with it, to have given them a taste of that home ownership and then to lose it we feel would be worse than never having it in the beginning. So they, they uh, investigate their uh, credit history, their employment record, uh, their uh, criminal record uh, is validated or verified. Um, none of those are by themselves uh, disqualifiers, uh, but collectively we try to make sure that the family can uh, successfully uh, undertake home ownership. And one of the goal, one of the uh, guiding principles is that the home payments are no more than 30% of the take home, of the take home pay that is available to a family based on their records and, and employment situation. And uh, many times before becoming Habitat uh, clients, they may have paid over 50% of their, of their uh, take home just for rent in many cases, very sub, substandard situations. But back to the, to the committees and the process again for a minute. So after they um, pass through the family selection committee and they're accepted and, and submitted to the board uh, and the board uh, uh, approves them, uh, then the process shifts into family support and family sponsorship and other individuals are assigned to work and mentor with them uh, through the waiting period from when they become approved until they eventually become homeowners. And during that waiting period and that mentor period, they'll have classes on budgeting, on finance, on uh, many of the details of home ownership, which they've never experienced. Uh, they'll have to be able to do minor maintenance things for themselves. They won't have a, a landlord to call. Uh, they have to be aware that they're gonna have insurance and property taxes and all those things that go along with ownership rather than rentership. And uh, there's, uh, quite a, a long uh, process and a number of classes and meetings and gatherings that are held um, with these applicants uh, before they eventually uh, rise to the queue and are the next to have a home that gets constructed. And all this time, they're expected to uh, be some of their sweat equity uh, by helping build their own or other people's homes and different things that are in support of the Habitat mission locally. Uh, the uh, actual construction of the home uh, will vary somewhat based on the size of the family and, uh, and the needs of the family, but normally it's a, uh, a three bedroom, uh, fairly small or fairly compact but efficient uh, layout and uh, because of that, uh, we often uh, construct a, uh, uh, an eight by 10 uh, storage shed uh, because there isn't a lot of extra uh, storage or closet space in the home. And this will add if it's on a slab basement. So this allows the, the family to have some place for the, like the kids' bikes or other lawn uh, lawnmower or other things that may be coming along with it. So that's the, that's sort of the habitat process. They also have to begin to save if they don't have adequate uh, so that they've got the money for a down payment. It's not as oppressive as a commercial transaction, but they do have a, a down payment and they, they can get some assistance um, with that qualify. But that's the, uh, that's the general uh, outline of a habitat um, application and the initial steps of the process 
prior to the actual building and quant ownership. Uh, current several projects which I can go into, but I I'm going to share here. I'm this is going to be one of my lives. So bear with me if it doesn't go too smoothly. But I have two uh, videos that I'd like to share. They've been produced by our local habitat chapter um, down in Bridgewater. We've got a staff member down there who's quite good at multimedia. She has got our presence now on Facebook, uh, on uh, Instagram, and uh, things like that. Um, but I have a, a video here. It's called the, the Impact of Habitat. So give me a second, and I'll try to screen share that. Thank you, Larry. Larry, we're hearing the audio, but from Eritrea, um, I've been in a refugee camp. Ethiopia, life is, is horrible. We're not seeing the territory. Yeah. Yeah. You're not getting the picture? No, nope, we, we hear the audio, but did you click share screen? Yeah, I did. Just a minute. Let me go back. Okay. And I'll take a look in the meantime. Yeah. You know, you should be able to share it with everybody. All right. Um, given that we're both fairly new at this. So. Yeah, exactly. So let me get back to the meeting here. All right, so there's the meeting. Now, let me try again. Is that coming up now? Not with the video, just the audio. Oh, I am. Yeah, it's it's on my full screen right now. Um, and you clicked on the bottom where it says share screen. Yes, I did. But let me uh, I'll go back again. Just that is literally the extent of my troubleshooting <laughs> capabilities. Yeah. yeah. So this okay. is my greatest fear <laughs> as I start teaching oh, third graders online. Yeah, so I, all right, so let me get the full screen up again. Uh, do share screen. Okay. Okay, let's see. That's the one I want to share. All right, let's try. There you go. All right. Third time is the charm. Yay! <laughs> Thank you. Is it there? Uh, it's not full screen. We, it's, I see where I'm originally from Eritrea. Um, I've been in a refugee camp, Ethiopia. Life is, is horrible. I mean, it's a very terrible life. When, when we came from Africa, first time, it's, it's very hard in the United States. You know, house is like, some people, they say it's a great opportunity, especially in the United States. Having houses is not easy. So we are lucky to get this house. We were moving like four or five times. After that, we just moved to Habitat for Humanity, which is this house. I'm happy to be here because now, through time, I get my experience and I got the freedom. Habitat changes people's lives in, in giving them opportunities to get involved, to become part of a, uh, of a community. Those kids and those parents, instead of simply thinking about how can we survive, they all of a sudden start thinking, oh, now that we own our own house, uh, what, what else can we do? 
across the state, we have uh, 256,000 people that are paying more than 50% of their income uh, to support housing. So you can imagine the, the burden and that's putting on those families. And as a ripple effect of that, you are uh, stressing them out and that affects the whole economic situation for, for the state. Yeah, well, I've often felt that it's a great way for the family to really begin to settle into and become a part of the community. It's, it's often that the Habitat House is the first step out of a very low income and limited situation into a more active member of the community. It's easy to be passionate about Habitat when you see uh, the, um, the, the fruits of your labor, when you see that uh, the families that you are helping, the, the homes that you're building are bringing in families with children that uh, uh, improves their standard of living. And in addition to that, they get plugged in into those communities where the homes are built. We've built uh, 60 homes over the first 30 years, so we're averaging about two homes a year, but the, the need hasn't gone away. In fact, it's increased. In fact, over this 31st year, we've done a rehab. We closed two homes in March, and we've closed two homes in April, and the goal is to make a jump to four homes. Now, we don't want to stop at four homes, but you know we need to make incremental steps. Uh, until we can provide a decent, affordable place to live for all individuals in Harrisonburg and Rockingham County. Community members uh, can help Habitat uh, by advocating for Habitat in, in many ways. Uh, volunteer, either as individuals or as uh, organizations, uh, whether it's you, you are a church, a business, any type of organization is, is welcome to come and help Habitat. There's a saying about if you uh, give a family a fish, they eat for a day if you teach them for a lifetime. We work with a family and we teach them how to be homeowners, uh, the national class so they know how to be homeowners. We allow them to um, put their weight behind building their own home. If you talk about uh, teaching them how to fish, we're giving them the tools about how to fish. We're giving them the knowledge where the good fishing holes are, and we're forming that relationship and going fishing with them. We need everybody's support to do that. We need volunteers to come out on sites. We need volunteers to work on our committees. We need donors to come up and, and help um, make donations for that to support this process. I'm, I'm, hey, it, did, it didn't get come full screen? No, I'm afraid it didn't. We heard the audio straight through, but um, no image. Yeah, no image. I'm, I'm very, very sorry. I can, I'll send a link to, it's, these are on YouTube. And uh, so what I'll do is uh, I'll, I'll send, gladly send anybody that, that wants it, my, my email. Uh, or you can just, uh, all of you, any of you can just type in YouTube uh, Central Valley Habitat Harrisonburg and you'll find about uh, six different clips out there uh, which are short videos like I attempted to share with you uh, and they're filmed here with our local families, our local director, some of the members of our local board and sponsors. Uh, this particular one that I uh, tried to share with you, uh, like I say, it was, uh, it was put together uh, to kind of give an overview to uh, the uninitiated uh, about the habitat process, and it featured some of the Eritrean families that uh, we had uh, placed uh, a little over a year ago here in Harrisonburg. Uh, out in the northeast part of town near the uh, Salvation Army shelter. Uh, and uh, we built three duplexes out there. So there are six families uh, living in some very nice uh, uh, shared our uh, duplex homes um, in this uh, relatively new development in that part of town. Uh, that's the one thing I like about this habitat chapter uh, our homes are 
sort of individually customized to both the surroundings and, the, and to the family. And they're not a standard cookie cutter uh, product. And, and it's pretty hard to, I don't think you could drive by on one and, on a street and say, oh, that's a habitat house because they really fit in with what's going on. Larry? Yeah, Bill. Bill Reinhold. Uh, did you have another video you wanted to show? Yeah, I did, but I, I don't what believe I'll it? show it if I can't if I can't get it for you guys. You what want was, me to you go ahead to find it? What was the name? Pardon? What was the name of the video you wanted to show? Oh, the second one? It was a family spotlight video. It's out there on uh, on the YouTube. Yeah. I'd like to share something, a way that Trinity was directly involved with the Habitat Build, if you have a chance for me to tell you that. You bet. Okay. Am I on now? You yeah. are. Yes, you oh. are. Okay. Some of you remember back in 2012, we had a very successful Habitat Fest choral event over at Bridgewater Church of the Brethren. Some of the folks from Trinity sang in that concert. Uh, just, just to back up before that, um, some of you know that Dick and I moved here from Blacksburg, where I was the organist at Blacksburg Methodist, and Dick had been Paris Associate at Blacksburg Methodist. We collaborated with a Sunday school class there called uh, Pairs and Spares. Uh, this is a group that has been in existence, still is, for over 50 years. They've all grown old together. But we approached them about being willing to help us build a habitat house with music. Um, so I won't, I won't take you through all of those steps, but uh, after we moved here in 2003, um, we went back to Blacksburg to help celebrate that chapter's uh, 20th anniversary as the oldest habitat chapter in Virginia, the New River Valley Habitat Chapter. Um, and so we started raising money. We got to about, uh, well, it was a, a real challenge because there was a, a sort of a, a burp in the progress of that chapter. So at some point, one point I thought, well, will the house ever be built? We had gotten to uh, $42,000 raised from music uh, sales of CDs and, and events. That's back when people would pay 12 to $15 for a CD. Uh, so we moved to, to uh, here to Harrisonburg and I almost despaired that the that project would never be finished. Actually, uh, we, I had not planned to continue the uh, idea here in Harrisonburg, but lo and behold, uh, we started, uh, I started one day I played over at Massanetta Springs for, for a women's conference. I played for about 10 minutes during the program and sold about $1,400 worth of CDs that weekend. Uh, so I didn't need any more encouragement than that. So we, we kept uh, harp extravaganzas back here, here and, and, and music events. And, and um, so we um, approached the, of course, approached the Habitat chapter in um, Central Valley. And uh, the lot, I was hoping the lot would be closer to town, but it was in Elkton. And I really celebrate and salute the participation of Elkton Presbyterian Church. Yes. Uh, and their, uh, their membership um, just were, they were just wonderful folks. And, and when, we, uh, when we had the, actually that house was the duplex in Elkton was completed and the family was dedicated and the family moved in before the house was ever finished in Blacksburg. Uh, anyhow, at the uh, dedication of the house in Elkton, Ann Ross uh, presided at the service, and the in one unit of the duplex, there were two young uh, boys, and so I took two of the small lap harps that Dick had made and showed them what strings to play, and the whole group sang, Jesus Loves Me, and the little boys played on their harps for us Aww. to sing, Jesus Loves Me. And um, so um, anyway, uh, um, we, so, the, the total project was finished with the houses, the house, the duplex here and the one in, in Harrisonburg. And in connection with the uh, local build, <coughs> Millard Fuller, the founder of Habitat, and his wife, Linda, 
came to a, a, a Parkview Mennonite church when we had a harp extravaganza and he spoke there and his, he and Linda came to Sunnyside and had supper with us. The painters were with us. i uh, forgotten who else came that day. But anyway, um, and then I happened to have a, a harp event in Columbus, Georgia when Millard's service was being held in Atlanta and Dick rode with some of the Habitat folks there to attend Millard's memorial service in Atlanta. So uh, that's a fast run through of our connection to Habitat. And uh, we've just been really thrilled to uh, see uh, what could happen through music. Thank you. Wonderful, Virginia. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Um, Mark, did you want to add anything? Yes, please. I've, I've, I've had the pleasure of being on the board with Larry for um, almost three years now. And uh, I want to witness, first of all, his tremendous energy. And I also want to be very grateful to Virginia for, for what she's done. Um, and draw from that, one of the real lessons for me has been the tremendous diversity and ingenuity of the way the whole volunteer process works. There may be a board of 12, but that represents committees that are 50, 60 people, as well as lots of people who come in to help. Uh, it's not all about nailing, you know. <laughs> in fact, that's kind of one of the smaller parts of it, uh, is the actual construction. What you're really talking about here is the transformation of individual lives, and I think also the community. Um, I mean, Larry made this point a little while ago, if you go buy a Habitat house, it doesn't, you don't say, oh, that looks like a shed or a double wide or something. Actually, in the neighborhoods that we find these houses, they're toning things up. They're actually creating a floor of value for that neighborhood that wasn't there before. Uh, so that there is a broader sort of civic uh, usefulness to this. Um, the other thing that really strikes me is how we may be Zooming all the time in our board meetings, but the work of Habitat has not slowed. We dedicate, we broke ground and we dedicated two houses in the last two months. In a, in a week, we're going to, we're going to dedicate another house. We're also moving ahead very quickly, I think, on the funding and the planning for is it five units, Larry, on, on Virginia Avenue? Two, two duplexes and a single house, I think? It'll be uh, three, three duplexes, so six families ultimately will be added to the, to the uh, uh, 600 block there on Virginia Avenue. It, it, exactly. In other, in other words, right up the street from us, if you drive, you know, you drive up 42 uh, before you get to, the, to, to, uh, um, to, that, to that Y right there, you can see some houses. There's sort of scruffy little ground. There used to be a greenhouse there that was shabby for a long time. Um, those kinds of areas, those kinds of resources. And then on the very distant horizon, um, people from Habitat are talking with uh, sympathetic uh, members of the city council about some land that belongs very close to our church, as a matter of fact, some land that belongs to the city that could ultimately become an entire neighborhood. In other words, you have an organization that is really poised to take on new and important things. And, uh, you know, we have a longstanding, as Trinity, you know, we have a longstanding relationship. You know, we buy a couple of tables at their banquet every year, which of course this year is virtual, but thank you very much for participating virtually. Um, and, uh, and if you need a link for that, just, just send me an email. I'll be happy to send it to you. The idea though of, uh, you know, an annual banquet and the idea of a covenant are two very different things. And what you witness in Virginia and what you witness in Larry is a covenant temperament, uh, a soul of a relationship that is, that is really very important. Um, the, uh, you know, the, the, the critique some people might bring towards Habitat is that it's really sort of like the bottom threshold of the middle class, um, and it doesn't go to people who have the greatest needs. I prefer to see it, and in fact, I do see it very differently. What it does is it takes people who are at risk of falling out of full possession of their lives and control of their lives and giving them just that dignity, that hope, and that capacity to actually earn and to, and, and to thrive. Um, I mean, a quick way to see that is the difference between people who are being gouged on rent for really shabby places 
for you know nine hundred thousand dollars a month for for you know which is sixty percent of their income, and then all of a sudden they've got a mortgage of five hundred, and that difference is is huge. Every month on our board meetings we review the delinquency uh, effects. Um, yeah, there's uh, you know there are some that are delinquent, but you know something that rate's not any higher than it is for the general public, and the people who get in trouble find a way to get out of trouble. And I think that's really, really important to, to foreground. So I think one way to think about it is we have these projects on the horizon. How does Trinity want to see its relationship with Habitat going forward, especially since we're going to have six units in our neighborhood, right? Uh, and, and conceivably an entire new neighborhood uh, over there, just the other side of the, of the school on Central. I also like to mention Bill Badal had a lot to do with uh, Habitat years ago. Oh, yeah. Bill's, Bill's one of our saints, yeah. Yeah. Yep. Sure. yeah. Um, so there's the, there, there is that. Um, one of the things that's, of course, the case is if you look at the sponsors of this, you know, it's either a, a big bank, a, a local bank, or it's a very large church. And uh, the, the sort of, uh, you know, basic uh, uh, amount that you need to, to be considered a sponsor is 35000 which is an awful lot for, you know, a church of our size. On the other hand, and this is something that's evolving right now, probably Bill Sanders knows something about this, is that through faith in action, we're, we're talking about faith builds, right, where you can have a consortium, half a dozen to eight churches uh, that, uh, that, that come together to be that sort of uh, basic um, foundational uh, funding uh, for another build. So that's something that I think you can, you know, you can sort of put in your um, put in your discernment bucket as you're as you're thinking about habitat and the other missions. This uh, the, the, this this. I want to thank Mary too, by the way, for handling this. Um, I, I think that uh, last fall was very rich uh, as we met and nurtured to talk about the various missions that that move us and. Uh, um, even if we have to do it online, I'm, I'm glad we're doing it. So do do get in touch with me or with Larry uh, if you want any more information about where the um, about where the work is, um, how to how to get involved. You can also just go to the Facebook page or the website of uh, Central Valley. Yeah, I I know that we're we're supposed to ring off here in a minute, but I intended to have more time for questions and answers. Does uh, do, do any of you, yeah, Bill, I see your hand up there. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> Trinity has had a long standing relationship with Habitat and Humanity locally. Um, uh, I'm, I know that uh, Bill Bedell uh, just labored, it was a labor of love with Bill. Yeah. Habitat could not schedule uh, a, a build without him being there, contributing labor and a joy and direction for them. But Bill was not alone in this activity. Richard Hogshead spent several, I mean, you can't imagine the amount of, of, of just volunteer effort that Richard Hogshead contributed in his retired years. Homer and LaRue. And Homer and LaRue were, uh, yes, indeed, they were active uh, in their volunteer support. Uh, and Neil. Oh yeah, well I I know Ramona was uh, uh, was family selection was for about five or six years. Uh, she maintained a uh, uh, the complete collection of data that they had and deposited with uh But one of the early uh, directors was uh, uh, Patterson from Bridgewater. Uh, an engineer that uh, had retired and uh, he, built, he was responsible, the director in our first builds here. Bill Springston uh, was uh, forever uh, trying to get Trinity to commit our lawn to a habitat bill. Uh, he, of course, Bill, I don't think Bill ever gave up on it, but uh, he, he he's no longer with us, so I guess maybe I ought to uh, take up Bill's charge. <laughs> John, you were raising your hand. Do you have a question? John, you need to take yourself off mute, please. There you go. Okay. There for a little while, there was an actual habitat at house church. Uh, Larry Barber, I think, 
as I recall, called that. And they went to various places, even in West Virginia and such. Uh, and there was a little while when I was living with my folks on Rosedale Court, the woman who was sort of head of that, of Habitat, or she had a big part of that, she lived more or less across the court from us. She had a boy about 11, 12 years old that I hung around with uh, for a while. Thank you. Anybody else have some questions while before we run out of time? One thing I think all of you probably know, but I, I, want, I always try to make sure people understand, Habitat does not give a house to anybody. They buy the house. We have a nonprofit, non-interest mortgage, which is in its own right a, a gift of sorts, but uh, the Habitat people buy their homes, or, as Mark said, the default rate is extremely low. As a matter of fact, to the best of my uh, able to research it, in all of our 30 plus years, there was only one home that had to be foreclosed and taken back. And that was not because of the fa family's financial needs. They happened to become involved in drugs and their priorities went elsewhere. And uh, that particular house was one that Habitat took back rehab and it and it continued on as a as a home for someone else yes yeah, susan Thanks. i see your hand up i just wanted to tell an interesting story when i was about 16 15 or 16 our family went to koinonia we went to america's georgia in 1976 and um the houses at koinonia farms um, those first houses were concrete. They were like igloos. They were round houses made of concrete that were supposed to be more sustainable. It was really interesting to see. Yeah, that's kind of the home. Uh, uh, yeah, it was kind of the home where Millard Fillmore and many of the other original founders uh, got started with this movement, which is now international, of course. And of course, Jimmy Carter. Yep. Oh yeah. I was there during the campaign time and met Miss Lillian and and um, Jimmy's wife, whose name I can't remember right now. Rosalind. Yeah. Rosalind. Rosalind. I met Rosalind and Miss Lillian at that trip. Anyway, yeah, it's a very impressive place. Well, again, uh, there. If those of you can, who can. Uh, find your way around the computer and the internet. If you go to YouTube uh, and and go to uh, and then type in Central Valley Habitat for Humanity Harrisonburg, you'll see some of the the various things that I had hoped to share with you this morning. And I apologize that I wasn't able to give you the picture to go with the sound. The sound was the sound was good. Mm -hmm. It was and. Um, yeah. Larry, if you want to send me those links, I'll see if we can get them up on the website or send them out by email. I sure will. I Thank sure you. Will. Okay, any, any other questions? questions? Yeah, I was going to say any other questions. I, I would like to just sort of like summarize what this all means to me by telling you a basic detail of the construction process. One of the first things I was impressed to learn when I got to Habitat was that they framed the outside walls with two by six. Now that doesn't mean anything to anybody who doesn't know about construction, but to be at code, you need to frame with two by four. They've added two inches to it. And it creates both a greater solidity. By the way, it doesn't take any more wood, but it creates a better solidity and allows you to put two more inches of insulation in there. Mm -hmm. And what that gives me is a metaphor for the way to move forward on this kind of thing build solid houses that more clearly and deeply protect those who inhabit them. And that seems to me to be where a church can get behind this full score. John Henderson, I see your hand again. I heard a story many years ago. Uh, many of you remember when Hurricane Andrew hit Florida. And there was a story that came out from that, that 
you know, there's was terrible devastation, homes and businesses destroyed. But as I understand it, the houses that were built by Habitat yeah. fared better than the commercially built houses. Mm -hmm. That happened in several hurricane, post hurricane and storm stories. Mm -hmm. There's an old statement that says that, that which is done in the name of Christ lasts. Excellent. On that note, if we don't have any more questions, Mark and Larry, thank you very much for your time this morning. Um, I'm going to have to visit the, uh, the virtual uh, presentation later in the day because I'm working late on Tuesday, but I will definitely check it out. Thank you all very much for joining us next week. Um, we'll be having someone from the Blue Ridge Area Food Bank speaking to us. Ellie Kale is gonna be your moderator. Um, so I will hand it off into her capable hands. Um, if you have any additional questions, I'm sure that um, Mark and Larry would be more than happy to answer them by email. Um, yeah. Anything else from the group? All right, seeing none, thank you all very much for your time. Enjoy.